The Fir Tree by Hans Christian Andersen Out in the woods stood a nice little fir tree. The place he had was a very good one. The sun shone on him. As to fresh air, there was enough of that, and round him grew many large-sized comrades, pines as well as firs. But the little fir wanted so very much to be a grown-up tree. He did not think of the warm sun and of the fresh air. He did not care for the little cottage children that ran about and prattled when they were in the woods looking for wild strawberries. The children often came with a whole pitcher full of berries, or a long row of them threaded on a straw, and sat down near the young tree and said, Oh, how pretty he is! What a nice little fir! But this was what the tree could not bear to hear. At the end of a year he had shot up a good deal, and after another year he was another long bit taller. For with fir trees one can always tell by the shoots how many years old they are. Oh, were I but such a high tree as the others are, sighed he, then I should be able to spread out my branches and with the tops to look into the wide world. Then would the birds build nests among my branches, and when there was a breeze I could bend with as much stateliness as the others. Neither the sunbeams, nor the birds, nor the red clouds which morning and evening sailed above him gave the little tree any pleasure. In winter, when the snow lay glittering on the ground, a hare would often come leaping along and jump right over the little tree. Oh, that made him so angry. But two winters were past, and in the third the tree was so large that the hare was obliged to go round it. To grow and grow, to get older and be tall, thought the tree. That, after all, is the most delightful thing in the world. In autumn, the woodcutters always came and felled some of the largest trees. This happened every year, and the young fir tree, that had now grown to a very comely size, trembled at the sight, for the magnificent great trees fell to the earth with noise and cracking, the branches were lopped off, and the trees looked long and bare. They were hardly to be recognized, and then they were laid in carts, and the horses dragged them out of the wood. Where did they go? What became of them? In spring, when the swallows and the storks came, the tree asked to them, Don't you know where they have been taken? Have you not met them anywhere? The swallows did not know anything about it, but the stork looked musing, nodded his head, and said, Yes, I think I know. I met many ships as I was flying hither from Egypt. On the ships were magnificent masts, and I venture to assert that it was they that smelt so of fur. I may congratulate you, for they lifted themselves on high most majestically. Oh, were I but old enough to fly across the sea! But how does the sea look in reality? What is it like? That would take a long time to explain, said the stork, and with these words off he went. Rejoice in thy growth! said the sunbeams, rejoice in thy vigorous growth and in the fresh life that moveth within thee. And the wind kissed the tree, and the dew wept tears over him, but the fir understood it not. When Christmas came, quite young trees were cut down, trees which often were not even as large or of the same age as the fir tree who could never rest, but always wanted to be off. These young trees, and they were always the finest looking, 
retained their branches, they were laid on carts, and the horses drew them out of the wood. Where are they going to? asked the fir. They are not taller than I. There was one indeed that was considerably shorter. And why do they retain all their branches? Whither are they taken? We know, we know, chirped the sparrows. We have peered in at the windows in the town below. We know whither they are taken. The greatest splendor and the greatest magnificence one can imagine await them. We peeped through the windows and saw them planted in the middle of the warm room and ornamented with the most splendid things, with gilded apples, with gingerbread, with toys, and many hundred lights. And then, axed the fir tree, trembling in every bough, and then, what happens then? We did not see anything more. It was incomparably beautiful. I would fain know if I am destined for so glorious a career, cried the tree, rejoicing. That is still better than to cross the sea. What a longing do I suffer! Were Christmas but come, I am now tall, and my branches spread like the others that were carried off last year. Oh, were I but already on the cart! Were I in the warm room with all the splendor and magnificence? Yes, then something better, something still grander, will surely follow. Or wherefore should they thus ornament me? Something better, something still grander must follow. But what? Oh, how I long, how I suffer. I do not know myself. What is the matter with me? Rejoice in our presence, said the air and the sunlight. Rejoice in thy own fresh youth. But the tree did not rejoice at all. He grew and grew, and was green both winter and summer. People that saw him said, What a fine tree! And towards Christmas, he was one of the first that was cut down. The axe struck deep into the very pith. The tree fell to the earth with a sigh. He felt a pang. It was like a swoon. He could not think of happiness, for he was sorrowful at being separated from his home, from the place where he had sprung up. He well knew that he should never see his dear old comrades, the little bushes and flowers around him, any more, perhaps not even the birds. The departure was not at all agreeable. The tree only came to himself when he was unloaded in a courtyard with the other trees, and heard a man say, That one is splendid. We don't want the others. Then two servants came in rich livery and carried the fir tree into a large and splendid drawing room. Portraits were hanging on the walls and near the white porcelain stove stood two large Chinese vases with lions on the covers. There, too, were large easy chairs, silken sofas, large tables full of picture books and full of toys, worth hundreds and hundreds of crowns. At least the children said so. And the fir tree was stuck upright in a cask that was filled with sand, but no one could see that it was a cask, for green cloth was hung all round it, and it stood on a large, gaily colored carpet. Oh, how the tree quivered! What was to happen? The servants, as well as the young ladies, decorated it. On one branch there hung little nets cut out of colored paper, and each net was filled with sugar plums and among the other boughs gilded apples and walnuts were suspended, 
looking as though they had grown there, and little blue and white tapers were placed among the leaves. Dolls that looked for all the world like men, the tree had never beheld such before, were seen among the foliage, and at the very top a large star of gold tinsel was fixed. It was really splendid, beyond description splendid. This evening, they all said, how it will shine this evening. Oh, thought the tree, if the evening were but come, if the tapers were but lighted, and then I wonder what will happen. Perhaps the other trees from the forest will come to look at me. Perhaps the sparrows will beat against the window panes. I wonder if I shall take root here, and winter and summer stand covered with ornaments. He knew very much about the matter, but he was so impatient that for sheer longing he got a pain in his back. And this with trees is the same thing as a headache with us. The candles were now lighted. What brightness, what splendor! The tree trembled so in every bough that one of the tapers set fire to the foliage. It blazed up famously. Help, help! cried the young ladies, and they quickly put out the fire. Now the tree did not even dare tremble. What a state he was in! He was so uneasy lest he should lose something of his splendor that he was quite bewildered amidst the glare and brightness. When suddenly both folding doors opened and a troop of children rushed in as if they would upset the tree. The older persons followed quietly. The little ones stood quite still. But it was only for a moment. Then they shouted that the whole place re-echoed with their rejoicing. They danced round the tree, and one present after the other was pulled off. What are they about? thought the tree. What is to happen now? And the lights burned down to the very branches, and as they burned down they were put out one after the other, and then the children had permission to plunder the tree. So they fell upon it with such violence that all its branches cracked. If it had not been fixed firmly in the ground, it would certainly have tumbled down. The children danced about with their beautiful playthings. No one looked at the tree except the old nurse, who peeped between the branches, but it was only to see if there was a fig or an apple left that had been forgotten. A story, a story, cried the children, drawing a little fat man towards the tree. He seated himself under it and said, Now we are in the shade, and the tree can listen too, but I shall tell only one story. Now which will you have, that about Ivedy Avedy, or about Humpty Dumpty, who tumbled downstairs, and yet after all came to the throne and married the princess. Ivedy Avedy, cried some. Humpty Dumpty, cried the others. There was such a bawling and screaming. The fir tree alone was silent, and he thought to himself, Am I not to bawl with the rest? Am I to do nothing whatever? For he was one of the company, and had done what he had to do. And the man told about Humpty Dumpty that tumbled down, who, notwithstanding, came to the throne, and at last married the princess. And the children clapped their hands and cried, Oh, go on, do go on. They wanted to hear about Ivedy Avedy too but the little man only told them about Humpty Dumpty. The fir tree stood quite still and absorbed in thought. The birds in the wood had never related the like of this. Humpty Dumpty fell downstairs, and yet he married the princess. Yes, yes, that's the way of the world. 
thought the fir tree, and believed it all, because the man who told the story was so good-looking. Well, well, who knows? Perhaps I may fall downstairs, too, and get a princess as wife. And he looked forward with joy to the morrow, when he hoped to be decked out again with lights, playthings, fruits, and tinsel. I won't tremble tomorrow, thought the fir tree. I will enjoy to the full all my splendor. Tomorrow I shall hear again the story of Humpty Dumpty, and perhaps that of Ivedy Avedy too. And the whole night the tree stood still and in deep thought. In the morning the servant and the housemaid came in. Now then the splendor will begin again thought the fir tree, but they dragged him out of the room and up the stairs into the loft, and here, in a dark corner, where no daylight could enter, they left him. What's the meaning of this? thought the tree. What am I to do here? What shall I hear now, I wonder? And he leaned against the wall lost in reverie. Time enough had he too for his reflections, for days and nights passed on, and nobody came up, and when at last somebody did come, it was only to put some great trunks in a corner, out of the way. There stood the tree quite hidden, it seemed as if he had been entirely forgotten. "'Tis now winter out of doors," thought the tree. The earth is hard and covered with snow. Men cannot plant me now, and therefore I have been put up here under shelter till the springtime comes. How thoughtful that is! How kind man is, after all! If it only were not so dark here, and so terribly lonely, not even a hair, and out in the woods it was so pleasant when the snow was on the ground and the hair leaped by. Yes, even when he jumped over me, but I did not like it then. It is really terribly lonely here. Squeak, squeak, said a little mouse at the same moment, peeping out of his hole. And then another little one came. They snuffed about the fir tree and rustled among the branches. It is dreadfully cold, said the mouse. But for that, it would be delightful here, old fir, wouldn't it? I am by no means old, said the fir tree. There's many a one considerably older than I am. Where do you come from? asked the mice. And what can you do? They were so extremely curious. Tell us about the most beautiful spot on the earth. Have you never been there? Were you never in the larder, where cheeses lie on the shelves, and hams hang from above, where one dances about on tallow candles, that place where one enters lean, and comes out again fat and portly? I know no such place, said the tree, but I know the wood, where the sun shines and where the little birds sing. And then he told all about his youth and the little mice had never heard the like before, and they listened and said, Well, to be sure, how much have you seen? How happy you must have been! I, said the fir tree, thinking over what he had himself related, Yes, in reality those were happy times. And then he told about Christmas Eve, when he was decked out with cakes and candles. Oh, said the little mice, how fortunate you have been, old fir tree. I am by no means old, said he. I came from the wood this winter. I am in my prime, and am only rather short for my age. What delightful stories you know, said the mice. And the next night they came with four other little mice, who were to hear what the tree recounted. And the more he related, the more he remembered himself, 
and it appeared as if those times had really been happy times. But they may still come, they may still come. Humpty Dumpty fell downstairs, and yet he got a princess. And he thought at the moment of a nice little birch tree growing out in the woods. To the fir, that would be a real charming princess. Who is Humpty Dumpty? asked the mice. So then the fir tree told the whole fairy tale, for he could remember every single word of it. And the little mice jumped for joy up to the very top of the tree. Next night two more mice came, and on Sunday two rats even. But they said the stories were not interesting, which vexed the little mice. And they, too, now began to think them not so very amusing either. Do you know only one story? asked the rats. Only that one, answered the tree. I heard it on my happiest evening, but I did not then know how happy I was. It is a very stupid story. Don't you know about bacon and tallow candles? Can't you tell any larder stories? No, said the tree. Then goodbye, said the rats, and they went home. At last, the little mice stayed away also, and the tree sighed. After all, it was very pleasant when the sleek little mice sat round me and listened to what I told them. Now that too is over, but I will take good care to enjoy myself when I am brought out again. But when was that to be? Why, one morning there came a quantity of people and set to work in the loft. The trunks were moved, the tree was pulled out and thrown, rather hard, it is true, down on the floor. But a man drew him towards the stairs, where the daylight shone. Now a merry life will begin again, thought the tree. He felt the fresh air, the first sunbeam, and now he was out in the courtyard. All passed so quickly, there was so much going on around him, the tree quite forgot to look to himself. The court adjoined a garden, and all was in flower. The roses hung so fresh and odorous over the balustrade. The lindens were in blossom. The swallows flew by and said, Why, Irvit, my husband is come. But it was not the fir tree that they meant. Now, then, I shall really enjoy life, said he exultingly, and spread out his branches. But, alas, they were all withered and yellow. It was in a corner that he lay, among weeds and nettles. The golden star of tinsel was still on the top of the tree, and glittered in the sunshine. In the courtyard some of the merry children were playing who had danced at the Christmas round the fir tree, and were so glad at the sight of him. One of the youngest ran and tore off the golden star. Only look what is still on the ugly old Christmas tree, said he, trampling on the branches so that they all cracked beneath his feet. And the tree beheld all the beauty of the flowers, and the freshness in the garden. He beheld himself, and wished he had remained in his dark corner in the loft. He thought of his first youth in the wood, of the merry Christmas Eve, and of the little mice who had listened with so much pleasure to the story of Humpty Dumpty. "'Tis over, tis past," said the poor tree. "'Had I but rejoiced when I had reason to do so. "'But now tis past, tis past.'" And the gardener's boy chopped the tree into small pieces. There was a whole heap lying there. The wood flamed up splendidly under the large brewing copper, 
and it sighed so deeply. Each sigh was like a shot. The boys played about in the court, and the youngest wore the gold star on his breast, which the tree had had on the happiest evening of his life. However, that was over now. The tree gone, the story at an end. All, all was over. Every tale must end at last. The Other Side of the Hedge by E. M. Forster, 1911 My pedometer told me that I was 25, and, though it is a shocking thing to stop walking, I was so tired that I sat down on a milestone to rest. People outstripped me, jeering as they did so, but I was too apathetic to feel resentful, and even when Miss Eliza, Dimbleby, the great educationist, swept past, exhorting me to persevere, I only smiled and raised my hat. At first I thought I was going to be like my brother, whom I had had to leave by the roadside a year or two round the corner. He had wasted his breath on singing, and his strength on helping others. But I had traveled more wisely, and now it was only the monotony of the highway that oppressed me. Dust underfoot and brown crackling hedges on either side, ever since I could remember. And I had already dropped several things. Indeed, the road behind was strewn with the things we had all dropped, and the white dust was settling down on them, so that already they looked no better than stones. My muscles were so weary that I could not even bear the weight of those things I still carried. I slid off the milestone into the road, and lay there prostrate, with my face to the great parched hedge, praying that I might give up. A little puff of air revived me. It seemed to come from the hedge, and, when I opened my eyes, there was a glint of light through the tangle of boughs and dead leaves. The hedge could not be as thick as usual. In my weak, morbid state, I longed to force my way in and see what was on the other side. No one was in sight, or I should not have dared to try. For we of the road do not admit in conversation that there is another side at all. I yielded to the temptation, saying to myself that I would come back in a minute. The thorns scratched my face, and I had to use my arms as a shield, depending on my feet alone to push me forward. Halfway through I would have gone back, for in the passage all the things I was carrying were scraped off me, and my clothes were torn. But I was so wedged that return was impossible, and I had to wriggle blindly forward, expecting every moment that my strength would fail me and that I should perish in the undergrowth. Suddenly cold water closed round my head, and I seemed sinking down forever. I had fallen out of the hedge into a deep pool. I rose to the surface at last, crying for help, and I heard someone on the opposite bank laugh and say, <laughs> Another! And then I was twitched out and laid panting on the dry ground. Even when the water was out of my eyes, I was still dazed, for I had never been in so large a space, nor seen such grass and sunshine. The blue sky was no longer a strip, and beneath it the earth had risen grandly into hills, clean, bare buttresses, with beech trees in their folds, and meadows and clear pools at their feet. 
but the hills were not high, and there was in the landscape a sense of human occupation, so that one might have called it a park or garden if the words did not imply a certain triviality and constraint. As soon as I got my breath, I turned to my rescuer and said, Where does this place lead to? <laughs> Nowhere, thank the Lord, said he and laughed. He was a man of fifty or sixty, just the kind of age we mistrust on the road. There was no anxiety in his manner. But it must lead somewhere, I cried, too much surprised at his answer to thank him for saving my life. He wants to know where it leads, he shouted to some men on the hillside, and they laughed back and waved their caps. I noticed then that the pool into which I had fallen was really a moat which bent round to the left and to the right, and that the hedge followed it continually. The hedge was green on this side. Its roots showed through the clear water, and fish swam about in them, and was wreathed over with dog roses and traveler's joy. But it was a barrier and in a moment I lost all pleasure in the grass, the sky, the trees, the happy men and women, and realized that the place was but a prison for all its beauty and extent. We moved away from the boundary, and then followed a path almost parallel to it across the meadows. I found it difficult walking for I was always trying to outdistance my companion, and there was no advantage in doing this if the place led nowhere. I had never kept step with anyone since I left my brother. I amused him by stopping suddenly and saying disconsolately, This is perfectly terrible. One cannot advance, one cannot progress. Now we of the road... Yes, I know. I was going to say, we advance continually. I know. We are always learning, expanding, developing. Why, even in my short life I've seen a great deal of advance. The Transvaal War, the Fiscal Question, Christian Science, Radium. Here, for example, I took out my pedometer, but it still marked 25, not a degree more. Oh, it stopped. I meant to show you. It should have registered all the time I was walking with you. But it makes me only twenty-five. Many things don't work in here, he said. One day a man brought in a Lee Metford, and that wouldn't work. The laws of science are universal in their application. It must be the water in the moat that has injured the machinery. In normal conditions, everything works. Science and the spear of emulation, those are the two forces that have made us what we are. I had to break off and acknowledge the pleasant greetings of people whom we passed. Some of them were singing, some talking, some engaged in gardening, haymaking, or other rudimentary industries. They all seemed happy, and I might have been happy too, if I could have forgotten that the place led nowhere. I was startled by a young man who came sprinting across our path, took a little fence in fine style, and went tearing over a plowed field till he plunged into a lake, across which he began to swim. Here was true energy, and I exclaimed, A cross-country race? Where are the others? There are no others my companion replied, and, later on, when we passed some long grass from which came the voice of a girl singing exquisitely to herself, he said again, There are no others. I was bewildered at the waste in production, and murmured to myself, What does it all mean? He said, It means nothing but itself and he repeated the words slowly, 
as if I were a child. I understand, I said quietly, but I do not agree. Every achievement is worthless unless it is a link in the chain of development, and I must not trespass on your kindness any longer. I must get back somehow to the road and have my pedometer mended. First, you must see the gates, he replied, for we have gates, though we never use them. I yielded politely, and before long we reached the moat again, at a point where it was spanned by a bridge. Over the bridge was a big gate, as white as ivory, which was fitted into a gap in the boundary hedge. The gate opened outwards, and I exclaimed in amazement, for from it ran a road, just such a road as I had left, dusty underfoot, with brown crackling hedges on either side as far as the eye could reach. That's my road, I cried. He shut the gate and said, but not your part of the road. It is through this gate that humanity went out countless ages ago, when it was first seized with the desire to walk. I denied this, observing that the part of the road I myself had left was not more than two miles off. But with the obstinacy of his years he repeated, It is the same road. This is the beginning, and though it seems to run straight away from us, it doubles so often that it is never far from our boundary and sometimes touches it. He stooped down by the moat and traced on its moist margin an absurd figure like a maze. As we walked back down through the meadows, I tried to convince him of his mistake. The road sometimes doubles, to be sure, but that is part of our discipline. Who can doubt that its general tendency is onward? To what goal we know not. It may be to some mountain where we shall touch the sky. It may be over precipices into the sea. But that it goes forward. Who can doubt that? It is the thought of that that makes us strive to excel, each in his own way and gives us an impetus which is lacking with you. Now that man who passed us, it's true that he ran well, and jumped well, and swam well, but we have men who can run better, and men who can jump better, and who can swim better. Specialization has produced results which would surprise you. Similarly, that girl... Here I interrupted myself to exclaim, Good gracious me! I could have sworn it was Miss Eliza Dimbleby over there, with her feet in the fountain. He believed that it was. Impossible. I left her on the road, and she is due to lecture this evening at Tunbridge Wells. Why, her train leaves Cannon Street in... Of course, my watch has stopped like everything else. She's the last person to be here. People always are astonished at meeting each other. All kinds come through the hedge, and come at all times. When they are drawn ahead in the race, when they are lagging behind, when they are left for dead. I often stand near the boundary listening to the sounds of the road, you know what they are, and wonder if anyone will turn aside. It is my great happiness to help someone out of the moat as I helped you. For our country fills up slowly, though it was meant for all mankind. Mankind have other aims, I said gently, for I thought him well-meaning, and I must join them. I bade him good evening, for the sun was declining, and I wished to be on the road by nightfall. To my alarm, he caught hold of me, crying, You are not to go yet. I tried to shake him off, for we had no interests in common, and his civility was becoming irksome to me. 
but for all my struggles the tiresome old man would not let go, and, as wrestling is not my specialty, I was obliged to follow him. It was true that I could have never found alone the place where I came in, and I hoped that, when I had seen the other sights about which he was worrying, he would take me back to it. But I was determined not to sleep in the country, for I mistrusted it, and the people too, for all their friendliness. Hungry though I was, I would not join them in their evening meals of milk and fruit, and when they gave me flowers, I flung them away as soon as I could do so unobserved. Already they were lying down for the night like cattle, some out on the bare hillside, others in groups under the beeches. In the light of an orange sunset I hurried on with my unwelcome guide, dead tired, faint for want of food, but murmuring indomitably, Give me life, with its struggles and victories, with its failures and hatred, with its deep moral meaning and its unknown goal. At last we came to a place where the encircling moat was spanned by another bridge, and where another gate interrupted the line of the boundary hedge. It was different from the first gate, for it was half transparent like horn, and opened inwards. But through it in the waning light, I saw again just such a road as I had left, monotonous, dusty, with brown crackling hedges on either side, as far as the eye could reach. I was strangely disquieted at the sight, which seemed to deprive me of all self-control. A man was passing us, returning for the night to the hills, with a scythe over his shoulder and a can of some liquid in his hand. I forgot the destiny of our race, I forgot the road that lay before my eyes, and I sprang at him, wrenched the can out of his hand, and began to drink. It was nothing stronger than beer, but in my exhausted state it overcame me in a moment. As in a dream, I saw the old man shut the gate and heard him say, This is where your road ends and through this gate humanity, all that is left of it, will come into us. Though my senses were sinking into oblivion, they seemed to expand ere they reached it. They perceived the magic song of nightingales, and the odor of invisible hay, and stars piercing the fading sky. The man whose beer I had stolen lowered me down gently to sleep off its effects, and, as he did so, I saw that he was my brother. <laughs>